Welcome to Oil Painting Question and Answers, episode number 13. Uh, before we get to today's questions, I want to do a short lesson on what I think is one of the keys to learning how to draw well. And uh, I have a couple of free videos on draw, mix, paint. One is uh, proportional divider basics, and the other one is learning how to draw in proportion, and that gets into the real step-by-step -step method that I teach um, and, and learning how to draw in proportion. But beyond that, there's something that I think uh, people who have a natural uh, drawing ability uh, do automatically. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I could always draw well, and I did this instinctively. And I've talked to other people who have a natural ability to draw. And it's the ability to look at a three-dimensional you know, scene or, or a still life or a portrait or whatever, but look at the three-dimensional world and then convert that three-dimensional world into simple two-dimensional shapes. So if, I, uh, if we look at this shape here on, on the screen and I told you to copy that shape, if you took your time, you probably wouldn't have too much trouble duplicating that. But if I asked you to draw this uh, opening of this wheelbarrow, uh, you might have more trouble. And that's because in, in the case of the wheelbarrow, you're, you're looking at a, at a scene, a three-dimensional scene in front of you, three-dimensional object. And when you look at things in three dimensions, it, you get tricked. And so shapes are a lot harder to draw. But it's the ability, and this is what I'm going to teach in the lesson, to see a, see a three-dimensional world in front of you and to convert that world into a simple two-dimensional shape. So, without further ado, let's get into some, uh, some more images. So let's start by looking at this blue vase here and looking at the reflection on the upper part in the middle. And if I isolate that reflection and just put it on a plain background, it's easy for anybody to look at that and see that shape. And if I told you to look at the reflection on your vase and if you were having problems with it, what you would do is you would visualize it as a two-dimensional shape just like this and you would compare the two-dimensional shape in your painting to the, to the two-dimensional shape that you actually see in the vase. Okay, so this is an easy one because the reflection is real distinct and you can see the line. But let's go to some others that are, aren't so obvious. Let's start with this uh, picture of my wife Emily and if you look at the entire shadow side of her face you can see this shape and until you visualize it and see it as this shape it, it may not be apparent but as you're painting let's say that you were doing a portrait of her and you had you know you were starting to come to completion you had taken all the time you need to plot your points and to take your measurements and to make sure everything's right and your curves are right and you've done everything you can but now you've finished the face and you're looking at this shadow here that I've drew a line around. And now if we isolate that shadow or that line of that shadow and put it on a plain background and I tell you, if I were to tell you go and draw this shape, it wouldn't be that hard for you if you took your time to get this shape right because it's just a simple shape. But now if we go back to the face and I flip back and forth here Without the line, if you have your eye trained properly, you will be able to see the shape instinctively. So it's a matter of learning how to see shapes. So let me just flip this off and on, and when I remove the line, now see if you can see this shape in her face. And if you can train your eye to do that, it's hugely helpful, because if you're just looking at her face, and trying to decide what the shape should be. You're, you're thinking about cheeks and jaw bones and the side of her face and the curves and all these other things. And in the, in the end, when you're finished, your shape should look like this shape. Simple as that. Two-dimensional shape. Okay, let's go to one more of, of Emily. And this one here, I've just drawn a line around the shadow line under her cheek on the right. And as you can see, it's the same old thing. Learning to see that shape in the face. And I'm just going to go back and forth here and help you to visualize it. But on your own, you should look into things, just like if I take her face here and you look into it, you should be able to see this shape.
And so you really, really need to train yourself. This is when you've already painted it in, you've, you've, you're analyzing the face, you're trying to decide if the shapes are right or the structure of the cheek is right. Instead of thinking about cheeks and shapes of cheeks and whether it looks funny or not, you simply break it down to this final um, form, which is a simple shape on her cheek that you have to draw. Now this is especially helpful in landscapes because a lot of, you get a lot of perspective lines and perspective lines can be confusing. But if I start with this um, picture here of Austin and we isolate the river which is going off into the distance and we look at it, at it as this simple shape, if I told you to draw this shape you wouldn't have any trouble probably getting it pretty close but if you look at it as a landscape it can be tricky so it's a matter of training your eye to see the shape of that river instead of thinking about perspective instead of thinking about you know rivers going off into the distance and does it look right you don't need to think about any of that you really just need to break it down to a two-dimensional shape that you train yourself to see and it's really a difference in the way that your brain works when it's looking at a scene going off into the distance and all the optical illusions that are present but when you turn it into a simple two-dimensional shape all of those illusions disappear and it's simply a line drawing on a background let's look at one more and this is a uh, landscape again same thing if you look at this you may have difficulty getting the the perspective on this path as it goes off into the distance but if you look at it as a simple shape it's much easier to draw so I hope that's helpful and it's something that you can um, can use and, and begin to practice and, and begin to train yourself to look for um, you know when I finish a portrait and I'm trying to get a likeness and that's the hardest thing in the world and you know of all the things that you paint when you paint a human face and you're trying to nail a likeness and get it exactly right where you have no room for error at all and I can be you know finished with a face and there's something wrong and I'm not sure what it is and I always go back to looking for shapes and if I look at for at the shape of the of the shadow on the cheek as a simple shape and compare my shape and my painting to the subject, um, that's, it really brings out the, the real differences in what you're looking at. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. All right, well now let's get into some questions. How did they produce what you call museum quality lighting with 5,000 to 5,500K bulbs back in the days before electricity? Did they work outside much more? How did they display work inside? Um, you know, the old, old studios before electricity always had big windows and those windows were always faced north uh, in the northern hemisphere they would be faced south in the southern hemisphere and uh, that those the reason that the windows would face north is because they did not want direct sunlight coming in and beaming in their studio because it's really hard to, to work in direct sunlight but that the color of that light that color of that just clear day skylight, not direct light, but skylight coming in is about 5200K. Uh, so that, so the, the bulbs that I recommend are really just trying to duplicate that old, um, you know, northern light studio light. And, and uh, the one advantage to using electric bulbs is that it's consistent all day long. And so you don't have that variation, which is, you know, a little bit of a um, hard to deal with and so it's you know I find it easier but in, in terms of the quality of the light I think that uh, the quality of you know electric 5200k light is equal to you know indirect skylight but that's that's how the old guys did it and um, you know and, and museums were set up with with windows and lighting in, uh, before electricity now they um, design them differently because we do have electric light but, um, you know, in the old days, they, they had to do it that way. And so, anyway, I hope that answers your question. I'm currently in the painting program at the University of Houston. I'm eager to try your limited palette, but the ventilation in our facilities does not allow for us to use regular oil paints. We are allowed to use water mixable oils, however. So I was wondering what would be the best comparable colors to use that are true neutral primaries, particularly the red, since I can't find anything like Rosa Corsa. Any recommendations of colors from other brands? 
Uh, first of all, the Geneva oil paint has absolutely no toxic fumes. It does not have any solvents in it whatsoever. So it's perfectly safe to use without any ventilation at all. So you may want to tell your school about that um, or ask them if you can use the Geneva paint. Um, and as far as uh, comparable colors, um, you know, and other brands, the, the alizarin crimson is a very good substitute for, for Rosa Corsa. Um, uh, most manufacturers will make a good dark ultramarine blue. Uh, try to find one that doesn't, uh, isn't as purple as some others. Um, pure cadmium yellow, you know, you just have to look at it and, and look for one that doesn't seem orange nor green but it's a real pr uh, true primary yellow. I don't know of any others out there that are as, as true of a primary yellow as our yellow is, although there may be, but I haven't found one. Um, but the, the main thing is, is on, the, on the Geneva color is you do not need ventilation with, with the Geneva color. It has absolutely no fumes in it, no solvents whatsoever. I would like your advice on which painting surface to use. I'm gonna be making my own. I like to do fine detail work and was wondering if I should make braced hardwood panels for their smooth surface or should I just stretch some fine tooth canvas? Um, well, you know, it's really a, a matter of opinion, I suppose, but my own um, preference is, for, is to have a little bit of canvas tooth, that very slight up and down, you know, rolling hill surface that is created by a, a primed canvas is it, it's just enough, uh, you know, um, variation in the surface that when you drag a brush across it, it pulls, it, it takes the brush out off of your paint, so you can actually get more coverage. It's uh, and when you have a really smooth surface, it's so slick that when you drag your brush across it, you end up wiping the brush, and you get a lot more, uh, you know, of your canvas showing through, and it's a lot harder to get full coverage. Um, you know, the other thing is you don't, you can actually make a really smooth uh, surface even with canvas. Uh, for about a year and a half, um, I used to uh, have my assistants uh, do, we would, I painted on a nylon canvas and we would prime it to the point where it was just smooth, just smooth as a panel. And I thought I would like that, but I decided in the end that I really preferred to have a little bit of the of the tooth that comes with canvas. So I would recommend the fine tooth canvas, but it's a matter of a personal preference. Could you talk about detail in a painting? For example, details of linen on a cloth under the objects in your still life, or the peel of an orange. Do you use a small brush to create every dot on the orange? That's a good question. Let me, uh, first of all, one of the, um, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it. But the, one of the uh, misunderstandings I think people have about painting detail is they think that you're supposed to paint the detail right when you start to paint. In other words, they'll start to paint and they just immediately are painting everything in detail and covering the canvas with all this detail. And that's not uh, really the best way to do it is to paint it with a loose brush stroke to lay and put in your values and your shadows and get your shapes right and get the overall, you know, where the, the values correct, the shape of your pair or whatever it is or, or your, you know, your fabric with the lace to generally get it put in. And then at that point, even, into, even if it's wet and wet, to come in and put the detail into that wet paint and to, and to refine those, that loose brushwork into detail. Okay, so, so instead of working and as you work putting in detail, you first get your forms in, you first get your big values, then your form, your shapes, you bump it around, you decide, yes, that's, everything's where it should be, the colors are right, and then you start to build in the detail. And uh, as far as uh, working with uh, a detail brush and, you know, painting an orange, for instance, you know, there's a lot of, I don't ever personally, um, you know, it's, I don't paint with super detailed brushes. I mean, very, very rarely would I do that. Um, but I think that you can almost fake texture on an orange with it with a bigger brush by just, you know, playing with the paint and kind of hitting it. But working in that wet paint is really the easiest way, believe it or not, to create uh, that higher level of realism. The biggest myth about painting detail is that people think you're supposed to paint it right at the beginning, right when you start. And, you, and it's not. It, you've really got to work on your forms and your shapes and your shadows first. Because otherwise, if your shape's off, 
and you've got all this detail in there, then you're going to have to wipe off all the detail that you've spent hours on. So uh, anyway, that's, that's, I hope that helps. And let me uh, direct you to a couple other uh, episodes. In episode number two, uh, we talk about painting details and values. And in episode painting ugly or learning to paint ugly, there's a lot of discussion in that episode about painting detail. I just watched your video, How to Mix Colors with Oil Paint. You start with the darkest black and then lighten it to make your paint swatches. I recall my teachers in college telling me one should always start with the lightest color and add a small amount of the darker color to it because I was told it is always easier to darken a color than it is to lighten it. I'm guessing you don't agree with that and I'm hoping you'd elaborate on why it is better to start with the darkest black first. You know, I don't know. It's just uh, my experience is just completely the opposite of that. Um, you know, I don't. There's there's a lot of different ways you can paint, and I don't know. You know what method your teacher was using, and there's a lot of different you know variables and ways you can approach it. But the way that I teach to paint is to mix colors from life, and so um, you know if you if you go you know every color is independent, and so I don't. You know, I certainly don't recommend mixing the darkest color and then the lightest color and then blending those two to create something in the middle. And I'm not saying your teachers uh, suggested that either. But every color from the darkest shadow through the midtones all the way up to the highlight, you know, each one of those colors exists on their own and, is and can be independent of the others. And certainly, you know, almost always they have, there's, there's, you know, as colors come from shadow to highlight, they tend to be in the same family, but that's not always true. But, um, you know, I just mix, I just like to mix my colors from dark to light first. You know, once you get white into a color, you cannot get rid of it. And a lot of shadow colors have no white in them at all. But um, almost all highlight colors tend to have white in them. And so if you're going from the light color into the dark color and those very first few steps in the darks have zero white in them, then there's really no way you're going to get there because you're going to have to, you know, start with a whole clean brush because even a little bit of white in your brush is going to milk those colors up and make them a lot more chalky and not as rich as they should be. Um, so, you know, it's just my experience that it's better in all respects to work from dark to light and that's especially true when you're painting to paint in your darks first and then your intermediates and then the very last thing you do is put in your highlights. And uh, so that's, that's what I um, have to say about that. Can I stain canvas for later use or is it better to just stain the one canvas I know I'm going to use? Um, sure, you can, you can certainly do that. I used to do it uh, for my workshops. I would roll out a big roll of canvas and just stain the whole thing or, you know, half of it and then stretch a bunch of canvases. The, the only issue uh, with that is that you wouldn't want to stain canvas and then not use it for like a year or two years where it really starts to dry and, and, and um, become more brittle because if you stretch a, uh, you know, a, the dry and a lot of the, the stain color and the, the color that the paint that you use to stain canvas with dries faster than uh, the paint you're going to paint your painting with. So in a year it may dry uh, to the point where it will crack when you try to stretch that canvas. But if you're talking about six months or less, I think you're fine. So as long as you use it up uh, quickly, then you're then it's a good idea and actually saves a lot of time. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, and there's actually one other advantage to, to uh, painting the or staining the canvas before you stretch it, and that is a lot of times when you stretch a tight canvas and then you put stain on it, uh, the stain will actually very slightly loosen your canvas. So by st uh, putting the stain on ahead of time um, and then stretching it, you eliminate that slight, you know, it, it just loosens the canvas ever so slightly and so you avoid that. If you want to watch more of my videos, go to drawmixpaint.com where you'll find a very long list of all my free videos on everything to do with oil painting. If you're interested in art supplies, go to genevafineart.com where you'll find the paint that we manufacture right here in Austin, Texas. And thank you so much. If you have any questions for me, leave them in the comments section of this video and I'll get to as many of those questions as I can in the next episode.